Hi, I'm John Hunter. Today I want to speak to you about a compelling technology which solves the fundamental issue of space exploration. That issue is the cost of propellant in low orbit. Currently it costs $5,000 per pound to put propellant in low orbit. Our technology will do that for one-tenth the price. Hydrogen gas guns can reduce the cost of space access by dramatic factors. We're talking factors of 10 easily. More than 90% of the mass for manned exploration is propellant. That's unequivocally true. So as a one-trick pony, we're targeting propellant. We want to launch propellant. So we believe that rockets plus quick launcher will revitalize space exploration this century. This affordable space exploration came from Project SuperHarp, which is a project at Lawrence Livermore National Lab in the mid-90s. I ran that project for several years. SuperHarp was a hydrogen gas gun that shot world record scramjets up to Mach 9 and beyond. In that process, we set multiple world records for high speed, high kinetic energy scramjets. It maps now into what's called quick launch, which is an aquatic version using the same propellant, namely hydrogen, which will enable us to launch 1,000 pound payloads day in and day out, as many as 4 million pounds per year into low orbit. For those of you who weren't watching, for the last 40, 50 years, what NASA didn't tell you was that it actually takes a million pounds of propellant per explorer to go to Mars and come back safely. The metric for the moon is not a lot better. It's 100,000 pounds. These are true metrics. Now, if you just do the current math at the, at the price of 5,000 per pound, a true Martian exploration with people, 10 people, for example, is going to come in at 50 billion for the propellant alone. Now, the interesting thing about these explorations is propellant is 95% of the total weight. And likewise, for the moon, we're talking 10 billion for propellant alone, where our system would come in at one-tenth that. Now, what I'm going to show you here is from soup to nuts, the quick launcher. What you see here is four pancakes. These pancakes are actually recoil absorbers. So when the launcher fires, they will go move backwards a little bit, and they'll absorb momentum against the seawater. Now this tube here is a composite steel and graphite vessel that's about a kilometer long. It turns out it's neutrally buoyant, which is one of the benefits of the aquatic version. The neutral buoyancy means it's not going to be floppy like spaghetti. If you had a long system like this on the ground, supported periodically, it turns out because it's so large, gravity would make it sag imperceptibly, and, and sag is very bad for high-speed guns. Now, as you look along this, you'll see some high-tension cables. <clears throat> These cables are attached to things that look like donuts. The donuts provide the rigidity in, in conjunction with the tight tension members. And so this thing can be aligned with high precision using lasers, so you've got an extremely accurate tube. We heat the hydrogen here with a natural gas and air heat exchanger. The hydrogen gets hot, gets to high pressure. Then a release mechanism right here releases. The vehicle starts down the barrel. This barrel's a kilometer long as the hydrogen expands. It goes faster and faster and faster. When it gets down near the muzzle, it exits at six kilometers per second. And then a couple of irises slam shut. Our intent here is to capture 99% of the hydrogen after the shot. Hydrogen comes out of these tanks here in this storage area, goes down into the system, and after the shot, it goes back into those tanks after it's been scrubbed. We don't want to pay for the hydrogen time and time again, so we will capture 99% of the hydrogen per shot. Seen from above, this is a kilometer long. You see it's agile. It can change in azimuth as per your desire. So over half an hour, it could change 30 degrees, for example. Seen from underneath, it looks like this. It's now tipping backwards and forwards because you may want to maintain it or tow it. This is the towing position. Here would be the maintenance position where we'd raise these pancakes above the water and do the, the maintenance on the high pressure part of the system. Now it's ready for a shot. Let me walk through the launch sequence for you guys. Quince, here's the vehicle, release valve. It starts to go down the barrel. Leaves the muzzle, sable pedals come off. At 100 clicks, you shed the aero shell. Roughly a minute, this thing is now at 100 kilometer altitude and you prepare to do a burn. At six minutes, you're now approaching the low Earth orbit depot, and you initiate the burn. The two tanks contain both fuel and oxidizer, and one of them is a little bit larger than it should be because it actually contains the payload as well. We are, by coincidence, del delivering fuel and oxidizer to the depot, so it, it matches well to our system. Here it is coming into the depot at nine minutes. Near Apogee, the burn has been completed. It's now maneuvering so it can enter the manifold. And when it gets in, a little orifice is opened up and it can now freely exchange RP-1, which is basically a high-grade kerosene, with the depot. Now our goal is 500 bucks a pound at the pump in Leo. Currently, the prices are about tenfold that number. Our four-phase project now intends to take the Sharp Launcher 
and use it to launch directly into space and break the world record for altitude, which is currently 180 kilometers. Phases two, three, and four are more sophisticated versions which will be submerged in ocean versions. And those will ultimately launch payloads between 100 pounds and 1,000 pounds into low orbit. The nice thing about this system is it has the agility to service all depots in low Earth orbit. In other words, if this thing is based at the equator, it can launch to, to azimuth zero, basically due east, or it can even launch 90 degrees to a polar orbit. So it can service essentially any customer you want to at any low Earth orbit altitude. Here's the atmospheric egress, which means launch out of the atmosphere at dusk. Of course, it's spectacular. You're going up at roughly a 25 degree launch angle, and you are ablating part of the nose cone on the aero shell. Phase one is we take the Super Harp system, we run it in a single stage mode, and we launch 40 pound objects into apogees in excess of 200 kilometers. This breaks the world record of 180 kilometers. Phase two, we build a 400 foot long version of Quick Launcher to launch single stage rocket motors in one kilo CubeSats. Now this is sort of a mock-up of a CubeSat. We did this work back for DARPA in, the, in 98. This successfully launched things inside of a gas gun at 3200 Gs. Uh, it had photovoltaics on it, it had store and forward, it had a TV camera, it had a lot of electronics as well as power supplies, and it worked flawlessly. Now phase three it gets extremely interesting because you're starting to make real money at this point. This is the QL100, which is roughly 400 meters long, and it turns out it looks the same as the QL1000 because you just scale them up by about a factor of two and a half or so. But these $50 million launchers can deliver supplies in certain classes of satellites on demand. For example, uh, DARPA had a project called Orbital Express, which supplied propellant as well as batteries to another satellite. And this dovetails nicely into that. Of course, we'd be supplying propellant. Phase four is the really large phase. This is 1,100 meters long and the same topology type system, but bigger. And we would supply folks like NASA and uh, European Space Agency. And of course, there's a bevy of space entrepreneurs these days, putting Bigelow Aerospace, Virgin Galactic, etc. So we'll be supplying affordable propellant to depots in orbit, and uh, that should enable manned exploration of Mars and the Moon. These are quotes from standard space leaders. Uh, Mike Griffin says, We've got to have a depot in space that's affordable. Otherwise, we'll never be able to do these missions to Mars and the moon in our lifetimes. And of course, the Augustine report corroborated that. More recently, Barack Obama has supported innovative techniques because he recognizes we're not going to get there from here with the current technology. You cannot afford to go to Mars if propellant costs 5,000 a pound. There is no way. This is the graph where the rubber meets the road. This slide here shows why our technology is superior to rocket launch. If you look here, what you'll see is these number of curves that show the percentage of payload as a function of dry mass fraction. The important salient feature here is that this blue curve is us. We're above 20%. Ordinary rockets are around 3%. In other words, we're seven times more efficient than a standard multi-stage rocket launch. Here's a requirement. <clears throat> we want to launch 4 million pounds propellant yearly to gas stations in Leo, and we charge two billion bucks, the rocket folks charge 20 billion. These are conservative numbers. And so I give a couple examples here. One is for, the, for a Mars expedition, where it would cost, in our case, $1.7 billion per year. We're amortizing over three years, because these are typically multi-year missions. And the same thing is done for the moon. And the bottom line is you can afford it, whereas before you could not. Now, the question is, are we real? The answer is yes. Uh, our core team is made up of the guys who ran Super Harp at Lawrence Livermore Lab. We all have the credentials of building things that worked and highly energetic systems, and we've worked on gas guns significantly. Uh, we had the original concept, raised the money, built and operated Sharp back in the 90s, and we set a large number of world records at speeds above three kilometers per second. Quick Launch is a great enabler of space exploration in this century. It reduces the cost of space exploration by at least a factor of 10. Quick Launch has currently got three founders. Our crew is a little bit hard-headed, but we've always been hard-headed and successful. We think it's important because if you don't use these new technologies, you never get off the planet, basically. It'll be 60 more years of the same. In other words, they won't do significant missions beyond low Earth orbit, and we really do believe you need to explore. The market, by the way, is huge because 95% of any exploration package is going to be propellant. An investor that comes in and sees this, uh, we will recognize this is a technology that comes along once in a millennium. This is your opportunity to make a big difference and be a part of history. Please join us.